Today, America continues to battle over abortion rights. But it wasn't long ago that the controversy in Connecticut was over the right to use contraceptives. Before 1965, it was illegal in Connecticut to prescribe, sell, or use any birth control devices. Contraceptives, along with obscenity and abortion, were outlawed by the Comstock Law, passed in 1879. Although the contraceptive ban was widely disregarded by doctors and condoms were available under the drugstore counter, for poor people, birth control advice was unavailable. The successful fight to overturn these laws led to widespread repercussions. So women who had enough money for private health care were getting help. Women who didn't have enough money for that and had to go to the clinics at the hospital were unable to get that kind of help. In 1923, New York City birth control activist Margaret Sanger inspired Mrs. Thomas Hepburn and two other Hartford women to found the Connecticut Birth Control League, later to become Planned Parenthood of Connecticut. For two sessions, I believe it was, between 23 and the time we opened the clinic, at least two or three sessions, bills were submitted to try and change the Connecticut law. They were defeated, and it was largely on a religious basis. Hepburn and her supporters continued their legislative efforts. Then in 1935, the League openly defied the Comstock Law and opened nine clinics in the state to offer information, condoms, and diaphragms. A woman had to be at least 18 years of age to be married, to have at least one child, and to be recommended by a doctor, a minister, or a social agency. And then, unfortunately, in the 30s, late 30s, our Waterbury Clinic was closed. The Waterbury Clinic was closed, the police raided the clinic, there were arrests made, and at that point in time, a decision had to be made around the other clinics. So it became evident that this would probably happen all around the state to the other clinics. And our lawyers on the board advised us to close in 1940 then. That was, we had been opened almost five years. I think some wanted to continue. I know Mrs. Hepburn did. She thought it would be just great if we went to prison and so forth. But by that time, I was married and had two children, and my husband was in active practice, and we somehow weren't very anxious to find me in prison for a couple of years. So we did close the clinic. But we did proceed then to continue trying to change the law in the legislature and every two years, groups would come, and it became more and more a contest and a shouting affair. There was an intense period of lobbying, and you will find women uh, throughout the state that were part of that, that went in buses up to uh, the state legislature. Every year they were there, and every year inaction happened. So many uh, bills had been presented to the Connecticut legislature to try to repeal those Comstock laws and it was totally unsuccessful because back then as now, Connecticut is primarily a Catholic state and, and we felt we had the, and the Senate was overwhelmingly Catholic and it off, the bill would often get through the House but would be stopped in the Senate. And what we did was not twofold. We worked in the legislature, continuing to work on the, the repeal of those statutes and we started taking women to New York. Uh, we organized caravans and buses, and basically to get a diaphragm, you're married in Connecticut, um, you know, you're basically wanting to space your children, and you have to get on a bus and go to Port Chester to New York to get a diaphragm. It felt like border running. It felt illicit somehow. Every time I came back across the border from Port Chester, I always felt as though well, I should look over my shoulder to see if the police were following somehow, a little like contraband coming in the state. In 1942, New Haven doctor Wilder Tylston sued the state, seeking to prescribe birth control to women at risk from pregnancy. After losing in state Supreme Court, he appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which dismissed the case, ruling that a doctor could not challenge the law on behalf of a patient. More failed lawsuits and legislative bills followed. Then in 1954, Essex resident Estelle Griswold joined Planned Parenthood as executive director. She was a friend of mine, delightful person. I'd gone through high school with her. She called me one day and said, 
what do you think about it? They've asked me if I'd like to take this job. I have a good job now in New York. And I said, Estelle, that organization is practically dead because we've gone to the legislature every other year and nothing's happened and the clinic is closed. And if you want to raise something from the dead, come aboard, which she did. That was all she needed. She was that type of person. And she came and stimulated everybody. Estelle Griswold secured the help of Dr. Lee Buxton, head of the Yale Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics, in finding five patients to join in a lawsuit to overturn the Comstock law. Once again, the state Supreme Court upheld the law, and an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was dismissed. This time, as Justice Felix Frankfurter wrote, because the Comstock law had gone unenforced for so long, the court could not umpire such a meaningless debate. After that decision, we decided that a clinic should be open, that if, in fact, there was no prosecution, then, then we would go ahead and open clinics and other communities, but the first one was going to be in New Haven. My impression back in 1961, at the time when we opened the clinic, was that there was really no great push to, to uh, prosecute. Certainly, no one was, was uh, actively pushing it, except for an individual named James Morris, who picketed the clinic. He also was very active in calling upon the governor and the s and senators and you name it to arrest the, the uh, people in the clinic and to prosecute. Still nothing happened, and so I went to see the prosecutor, Julie Moretz, one day to ask him uh, just what was going to happen. And he said, well, you know, he was getting pressure from here and there. Pe people wanted to... Uh, do something and he didn't really care, but he guessed he was going to have to do something. And I suggested to him that I would be happy to have Mrs. Griswold and Dr. Buxton come down and surrender at uh, headquarters rather than have a raid. So that's how we worked it out. Estelle and Lee went down by appointment one day and, and were arrested and the case began. On Saturday morning, I received a call from Mrs. Griswold saying, you said, is there anything, if there's anything I can do, let me know. There's something you can do. And I said, what? <laughs> she said, we need you to turn state's evidence so that we can get this case into the court. I said, turn state's evidence against you? And she said, we need three patients who were at the clinic who will, in fact, say in court, yes, Mrs. Griswold advised me to use birth control. Yes, Dr. Buxton prescribed for me. Um, and then with that proof that we have broken the law, we can go ahead with the case in court. The state Supreme Court again upheld the constitutionality of the Comstock law, and once more the case reached the U.S. Supreme Court. But this time, Planned Parenthood attorneys had added a fateful argument to their plea. When the case got to the Supreme Court, the court had to consider a an extremely fundamental question. The question was, is there in the Constitution a right of privacy, a constitutional right of privacy, that the state simply cannot interfere with? And the court said, yes, there is. The word privacy is not mentioned in the Constitution. The concept of a right of privacy is not mentioned in the Constitution. But Justice Douglas, who wrote the opinion for that court, said that there are express rights given in the Constitution, but from those express rights, there are emanations that create penumbras around those rights. And the right of privacy is one of those penumbral rights around the First Amendment that makes the express guarantees of the First Amendment work. That was a very significant decision. Although there had been aspects of privacy protected before, this was the most important decision giving full protection to those aspects of marital privacy. And it was quite clearly the forerunner of the uh, abortion decision, which was decided uh, many years later. But that was a decision grounded on the constitutional right of privacy that had been decided in the Griswold case. 
The decision allowed Planned Parenthood to enter a period of significant growth, leading the state fight for abortion rights and providing health care and family planning services. Today, its clinics provide education, counseling, and medical services, including about 3,000 abortions to more than 51,000 clients each year. In 65, the decision comes. About the time the pill is coming into usage, there's much discussion around fertility, and you'd find the first national family planning money. And so with that consciousness on a national level came an acceptance that birth control is a public good. For Planned Parenthood of Connecticut, you go from one clinic to where we are now, 20 clinics. The explosion of provision of service that happened in the 70s was based on the Griswold versus Connecticut case.